Welcome back to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. Today I'm joined by Abby Foreman, who's a fellow nutritional therapist. She also studied at CNN, the same place that I studied at um, in Manchester, the College of Naturopathic Medicine. So for those who don't know about Abby, since her celiac diagnosis over 20 years ago, Abby has turned her health around using nutrition and lifestyle approaches. Now, as a qualified nutritional therapist, Abby draws on her own personal experience and nutrition knowledge to guide her clients through the journey to optimal health. She runs her nutrition clinic in York in the UK and also holds online consultations for those who aren't nearby offering personalized nutrition advice for those suffering with chronic digestive complaints, celiac disease, and other autoimmune conditions. She believes everyone has the ability to take back control of their health long-term. And you can find her on Instagram at AF underscore nutrition, where she shows nutrition insights and celiac friendly recipes. Her website is afnutrition.co.uk, where you can access her nutrition and food blog, download freebies and find out details of her services and how to contact her and I'll obviously link to those in the show notes as well for anyone who's wondering or can't write them down or find them right now so yeah hi Abby welcome to the podcast hi Viv thank you so much for having me I'm really excited to be you're here. welcome I know I'm guessing it's your first podcast is yeah, that right? yeah. First podcast. amazing yes. but I always listen to yours so um oh perfect yeah I'm just really happy to be among the mm -hmm have sharing yeah yeah so you kind of know what it's about on here so um even though we're not talking about hormones today I do like to incorporate a lot of talk about the gut because it is so important and if your gut's not healthy your hormones can really never be optimal so why don't you start off by sharing your journey with celiac disease because even I'm not aware of like what you've gone through I know you're pretty young when you were diagnosed but how were you diagnosed was it a long process yeah give us the insight yeah of course so yeah I was diagnosed at the age of seven which um back then celiac disease was unheard of gluten wasn't even heard of mm -hmm. back then so um I don't I don't actually remember much of it so I've had to over the past few years like talk to my mum and dad about the process because yeah I was I don't know if it's just the fact I was young or because I was that ill that mm -hmm. I don't really remember um but I know that I was really poorly leading up to my diagnosis so I couldn't even spend a full day at school without falling to sleep. Right. Oh my God. My mum said she would obvious, um, often get phone calls to come and pick me up like halfway mm. through the day. And if I did spend a full day at school, then I'd be at home on the sofa, wouldn't be able to eat anything and would just be sleeping basically. So I was just a really poorly child um, at that time. And I remember going to hospital a lot and getting a lot of blood tests. And I remember being off school a lot and having work sent home for me because I was getting like behind in school. So yeah, I think it was quite a long process in getting that diagnosis because celiac disease wasn't known then. Um, I think they even told my parents that, you know, it could, it, I had the symptoms and because my white blood cell count was so low, they were looking even at things like leukemia. So it was mm -hmm. quite a scare for my, for my family. But um, I got the diagnosis of celiac disease and then I think the challenges came to not just change up a seven-year-old's diet, but my mum and dad had to figure out what gluten was because even the consultants at the time didn't really know much about it then. Um, so we weren't really well educated with it, I would say. Um, and I just remember as a child, always going to parties and having to have my own food brought to yeah. me and children looking at me like, why does that girl have a really plate of food? Oh um but I mean yeah it wasn't it wasn't a big deal there's there's worse things out there to yeah. deal with I suppose um and yet yeah, my health started to pick up over the the next year and I started to get my um, energy back and get some color back into my skin my mum always says um mm. and then my teen years hit and I started started going out with friends and just um exploring different foods and I started to introduce gluten back into my diet oh. because I did and that's the thing I didn't know what celiac disease was yeah. right I had oh no idea God. and I didn't I didn't really get the di typical digestive symptoms which a lot of celiacs actually don't mm -hmm. they do suffer with digestive issues but a lot of people just think that that's normal um, for me, looking back then, I was just always ill. I always had cold sores. I was really pale um, and just always tired, always complaining I was tired. 
and um but yeah I just used to eat gluten and not really think anything about it and then my mum t- my mum started to catch on because I got so ill and I think I came down with um swine flu I think it was when there was an oh, outbreak yeah, of yeah. swine flu and I had that for really badly for quite a few weeks mm. and then my mum was talking to me about the gluten and I was like well I don't think I'm celiac anymore because I don't get the symptoms <laughs> I've healed I've, I've outgrown it <laughs> I've outgrown it I've healed myself by eating yeah. gluten <laughs> and, um, so she took me to the hospital and um, back to the consultant and they t- retested my bloods and my antibodies were really high so he confirmed that I am still celiac and mm. I need to go on a gluten-free diet and he basically he basically scared me into it he was like oh if you if you don't eat start eating a gluten-free diet then you will be in a wheelchair when you're older and <laughs> gave me all the because there's a big risk of osteoporosis yeah. I'm yeah, sure yeah. I'm sure we'll talk mm-hmm. about but um and, and all of that he didn't actually educate me on what celiac disease was he just scared you into scared never me. eating gluten again <laughs> <laughs> exactly so then I went off to to uni and I was eating, eating gluten-free but I wasn't careful like I wasn't mm. really aware much of cross-contamination um I, did, I still didn't really know much about it I just knew I couldn't eat gluten because I'd get these symptoms um and then it was when my undergraduate dissertation came along and I studied marketing, so I wanted to look into consumer behaviour into gluten-free foods because it was the time when gluten-free was all the range and everybody thought they were healthy being gluten-free. So I think, I think my title was something like consumer behaviour of gluten-free pasta in those without celiac disease. So I looked at people mm. who weren't celiac. And that just that, that research I did just really it was a, it was a turning point for me and my health because it taught me what celiac disease was I got a real insight into it and the actual risk factors how the body works with celiac disease um, and it was also kind of like the time with deliciously Ella coming about so there was a nutrition side of things because she was gluten-free and basically that whole process led me into nutritional therapy and that's when I decided to study at CNM and then when I was doing that sort of the last five years I would say I've just been really focusing on my gut health and putting things in place through nutrition and lifestyle to restore my digestive system to manage my immune disease uh, autoimmune disease and support my immune system and just promote optimal health um because there's a lot out there that you know people say that with celiac disease you're more likely to have a um lower health rate and um more risks of diseases such as like bowel cancer and stuff in the future and i think you do have the opportunity to live your optimal health being celiac and other autoimmune conditions you just need to know how to and you need to educate yourself on it um so that's why i qualified as a nutritional therapist so i could impart my knowledge and experience amazing and you're right with the um the symptoms as well you can you have the genetics that that's never going to change Mm -hmm. but you can turn them on and off you can live symptom free but yes if you do go back to eating gluten obviously or other people with maybe a different autoimmune condition if they start not sleeping well the diet's terrible symptoms will come back so it's Mm -hmm. always you're going to always have that blueprint but it's how you kind of play your hand of cards that is the important factor so let's Mm -hmm begin with what exactly is celiac disease i think a lot of people know and it's one of the autoimmune conditions that people are more aware of um like what is it what happens how common is it um Mm -hmm. what are some of the risk factors yeah so celiac disease is an autoimmune condition in response to gluten in the diet so i think there's like they say one in a hundred people in the UK have celiac disease, um, but only 30% of those people are actually diagnosed. So there's a lot of people out there that um, are living with celiac disease without realizing it. Um, it's often misdiagnosed for other digestive issues, like IBS is quite, pop- um, quite common. So one in four people with celiac disease are actually misdiagnosed with IBS. And from symptom onset, I think it can take as a, an average of like 12 to 13 years to actually get diagnosed Whoa, with celiac oh disease. Um, and it is just about understanding, it, like you said, your genetic risk factors and your overall health as to um, why you could potentially have celiac disease. So in a, in a person with celiac disease, their immune system recognizes gluten in the diet and triggers, like causes an immune response. But instead of causing an an immune response to gluten, it attacks healthy cells. That's what autoimmune disease is. It's attacking healthy tissue. And for celiac disease in particular, it attacks the lining of the the digestive system. So the small intestine, 
uh, specifically some um, uh, an area called the villi and the villi and the small intestine are responsible for the absorption and um, play a big role in the digestion of the nutrients that we get from our food and in celiac disease they are they're damaged so they're usually they're described as like finger-like projections so they're kind of um, catching all the food as it goes through really the particles and um, in celiac disease they're flat so there's no way that our body can be basically absorbing or, or digesting optimally um, which leads to a, a range of different symptoms so the autoimmune response and the villi being damaged um, leads to a range of digestive symptoms I think you could safely say that the majority of digestive symptoms out there are, are common in celiac disease especially um, like foul gas like foul smelling mm -hmm. gas um, foul smelling stools, um, bloating, pain, like that type of symptom. Yeah. Um, and then other digestive issues as well. But a lot of the time people with celiac disease, they will have digestive issues, but not as cr not that chronic. So they kind of, they don't really consider celiac disease, but um, because of the malnutrition, the it can impact basically every system in the body. So you can even start with things like aching bones and joints because you're, bones aren't getting the nutrients they need to function and grow well and develop well and then you've got things like headaches and um, migraines brain fog brain fog is a big one for me if I ever think I've been gluten it's because mm. I can't concentrate like I can't focus on something I feel really tired and just quite busy um numbness as well in the like, and numbness and tingling in the um feet and the the toes and the hands um things like an interesting one is anemia. So if you're anemic and you're unresponsive to iron supplementation, um, that's a big sign of celiac because our body can't absorb the iron supplementation. Mm -hmm. And then in children, even things like, you're just looking for inability to thrive, basically. So like I said, I just didn't have the energy to even stay awake in school. Mm -hmm. I was really pale as a child and like stunted growth as well. Stunted growth is something. Any people who know me know that I'm quite a small person <laughs> um, we'll say I, that <laughs> yeah. um I mean I'm not just blaming my celiac disease for that at all but um it could have contributed so um yeah there's a there's a lot of there's a whole range of symptoms out there um that can go along with with celiac disease and it's crazy to think like gluten or this autoimmune condition can affect your brain and your mental health and your yeah. growth but it is that inflammation that's going on and those nutrient deficiencies alone can affect every single cell of the body because you need vitamins and minerals to process enzymes and activate things so if you're lacking in one thing like magnesium for example there's going to be over 300 processes that can't work optimally and that's just one nutrient so yeah exactly. absolutely and it's it's interesting that your symptoms were more of the neurological factors and people need to be aware of that that you don't actually have to have digestive complaints to have poor gut health um, but particularly yeah. celiac yeah definitely i think that could be one of the reasons why it could be undiagnosed as, uh, so undiagnosed as well mm. just because um people don't always have the typical digestive digestive symptoms and the brain issue the brain like brain fog and neurological issues are a big one because gluten actually bypasses the blood brain barrier and causes inflammation in the brain and it can have a um what's like is it like, like opioid, opioid, an opi yeah. opioid yeah. effect yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is quite scary when you think about the inflammation that that can cause and then the 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 future risk factors mm. that that come along with with that so and dairy so, yeah. is the same like dairy has similar ones i know that that one's the case or morphine so it has like mm -hmm. an opioid or morphine effect in the brain so it temporarily makes you feel good and that's why it's so addictive people who are like don't take my bread don't take my pasta they often have or cheese or whatever they often have an issue with that because it's every time they eat it it's a little bit of inflammation a little bit of pain but they get those pleasure reward centers mm -hmm. like lighting up in their brain it's like when people get tattooed they're like oh i like the pain but it's also not good for me so that's that's kind of how i imagine it and that is yeah. very common i see people with maybe if it's not celiac disease gluten sensitivity they're really attached to the bread and when they do cut it out they do start to notice or maybe it's not making me feel good mm, yeah because of that that mm -hmm. effect definitely yeah. and it's interesting how you said dairy there as well because 
Um, although obviously gluten is a main thing with celiac disease. Um, I also would recommend people, especially in the initial stages of either, even if you're just newly diagnosed or if you have been diagnosed like myself for 20 years, but you're starting to make, to realize that you need to take extra steps and um, removing dairy um, for at least a few months is one of my, my main priorities. Because if you, if you think about your digestive system and the damage that's caused in autoimmune disease in general, never mind celiac disease, but obviously you've got the local attack of the digestive mm -hmm. system in celiac disease. Um, your body can struggle to digest dairy because that's where the lactase enzymes are produced. Um, so just to reduce that initial inflammation and help get that inflammation down, I would always try and avoid dairy. Yeah. Um, in the initial stages yeah and i'm guessing you do that with a with a lot of things because it's absolutely isn't it? yeah. yeah gluten and dairy sensitivity typically go hand in hand um it may be that someone with celiac can eventually introduce dairy again obviously not gluten but um yeah the the inflammation caused in the gut can really affect many foods and there's other foods that may be cross-reactive which we'll come on to a mm. li little bit later with gluten um so with celiac disease I know with other autoimmune conditions, they can be triggered. So there may be a stressful life event, like a divorce or a car accident or something that can trigger Hashimoto's or the, the start of rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Is that the same with celiac or is this one that you're, from the moment that you're born, it's something that's um, prevalent? It's something that you're destined to have. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. There's things you can do to, well, the th there are things you could do to prevent the onset, but I think the main triggers like any autoimmune disease so i think instead of looking at celiac disease as um that disease and that diagnosis and that condition i think we need to start looking at things as that auto, the autoimmune response and why we have an autoimmune response um so we've mentioned genetics so there's three things that we need in order for our bodies to have an autoimmune prevalence and that's the genetic predisposition um, and then you need to have the internal environment and an external trigger. So the gen genetic predisposition with celiac disease is usually the HLA um, gene. There's different gene mm -hmm. variations of the HLA. And I know I have that. I've tested my genetics. Um, and then what did I say before? After The that? internal uh, environment. The internal environment. So that's basically coming down to something called intestinal permeability or leaky gut. They're both the same thing, just depending on who you're, you're talking to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they both mean the same thing. And basically, um, I know you spoke probably about intestinal permeability on here before, but just to quickly go through it, the lining of our digestive system is um, only a few cells thick. It's really thin. And then it's protected by like mucous membrane. And that's where the villi live that are attached in, in celiac disease. And there's something called tight junctions that keep those cells really close together so the digestive system can function optimally. Um, with leaky gut, um, what happens is those tight junctions start to come apart and create basically holes in the digestive system, make the digestive system more permeable. And then what happens there is um, food and bacterial pathogens and other things that should stay in the digestive system, they actually enter the bloodstream and then the, blood, uh, the immune system recognises those as foreign objects because they shouldn't be there and creates an immune response. Um, and in, not, in a lot of individuals, it might not necessarily correlate to an autoimmune disease. Um, you kind of have to have that genetic background as well. But, you know, chronic exposure to these pathogens in the digestive system can lead to an autoimmune condition. So you need to have that environment there in order for an autoimmune disease to present itself. And then the, this is where the environmental trigger comes in. And with celiac disease, you, you do have to be eating gluten in order for that to, to trigger. But there's so many other things that can actually be the, the trigger for celiac disease to, pre, to present itself. So you've got things like um, medications, chronic stress, just, the, just a general processed diet, like um, not even just gluten, just general processed food like sugars um, and even things like viruses. So I was actually, I came down with scarlet fever a few months before. I was diagnosed with celiac mm -hmm. disease before my celiac symptoms right. started. So I don't know that I'm just putting like everything together, but yeah. that could have been my trigger. Definitely. Who, who knows? So I was eating, I have the HLA gene. Um, I was eating gluten. I would have had some sort of damage to the digestive system. 
and then scarlet fever came along and that could have just been the trigger interesting yeah. and were you um natural birth or bottle fed i was natural birth and um, bottle bottle fed but i bre- breastfed for a okay. few weeks i think up yeah. to six weeks which is the, the prime time for breastfeed. Yeah. I know you yeah. did um, a podcast a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So that's probably a better one to listen to for breastfeeding. But um, that has the um, colostrum. Is it the colostrum yeah. that um, basically helps protect, um, build, the immune, build the immune response and, and protect the gut, that gut lining? Um, and breastfeeding is actually one of the main preventions for um for celiac disease yeah. and other like any yeah any yeah. condition it really improves health and those first few weeks yes it would be ideal for a year two years but i think mm. back then not many people were aware of the benefits and mm. bottle feeding was promoted and obviously people may not be able to breastfeed for that long so yeah just thought i'd ask because that could be one of the factors as well um mm-hmm. and gut health can be impaired from a c-section birth you just may not be set up optimally from the get-go but yeah very interesting and why is gut health so important to overall health um and just get touch on hormones as well okay um as in hormones in related to celiac disease or just in, in... how how a, how is healthy gut how is a healthy gut important for hormones energy mood like why is it so important can we just live with an unhealthy gut what would be the the side effects of that long term okay yeah so as we've explained about the leaky gut and the um the immune response there obviously that's causing general inflammation anyway because any immune response is an inflammatory response so when you have inflammation then you're more likely to have something called like a damaged microbiome so um, i know you've probably talked about microbiome in here a lot as well but it's basically the build-up of your gut bacteria and you have your good bacteria and bad bacteria they both work synergistically um it's not there's not really that either one are good or bad it's just the healthy balance of them and when you have a lot of inflammation and an unhealthy digestive system that can become imbalanced which can lead to a lot of um digestive symptoms so things like bloating um foul stools all of the different ibs type symptoms Mm -hmm. that you would get Um, it can also impact liver detoxification um, and I think that's a big thing we see that dis- we see that disease in particular. If your digestive system isn't functioning from the get go and you're not absorbing all of those nutrients, then it's going to have um, a likely impact on your liver's ability to, to detoxify. And liver detoxification is really important for hormone synthesis. So our liver is where a lot of our hormones are made, and also where our the hormones that we don't need to use are detoxified out. And then um basically what happens is we um, eliminate those in in the stools in in the bowels and if we have an unhealthy digestive system we could potentially be constipated for example and that means that those hormones and other pathogens that our body wants to get rid of are hanging around in the colon for too long and get reabsorbed um so you've got you've got that side of things there and by actually by reabsorbing those um those pathogens that's what can cause ill health in regards to fatigue headaches because you've just got these pathogens circulating in the blood that you mm-hmm. don't you don't really want there um, yeah. and it impacts on the overall detoxification so even things like detoxification through the skin it can lead to acne and other skin conditions and there is actually an autoimmune condition um, alongside celiac disease called dermatitis hepiforma- hepiformis mm-hmm. um, and that's um, a reaction to the skin from from gluten the same kind of autoimmune autoimmune response but to the yeah. skin as well yeah. yeah and so with the hormones it is either you've not got the building blocks to create healthy hormones um, yeah exactly so yeah. the digestion yeah. side of things you're not you're not actually if even you could be eating a really healthy diet rich in a good quality protein mm-hmm. loads of healthy fats because healthy fats are the building blocks yeah. of hormones um but if your body isn't absorbing those so if you again if you think back to celiac disease we don't our villi our villi is so damaged we become malnourished and mm-hmm. um, so we don't even have the simple building blocks to um build our our healthy cells and our hormones yeah, yeah. and i experienced that obviously not with celiac but when my gut was really bad when i had SIBO and parasites and leaky gut and all of that i was eating an organic diet spending all of this money on food i was still losing weight i was just so depleted my period hadn't returned 
and I was like oh my god I can't get enough food I was just constantly eating and just feeling malnourished but Mm. yeah I was eating like thousands of calories so that is an important piece the gut hormone connection and then you're right with the detoxification your liver is so it requires so many nutrients to function optimally for phase one and phase two so again a simple nutrient deficiency but with celiac there's multiple so it can affect the excretion of estrogen androgens Mm -hmm. so any estrogen dominance or pcos anything like that you just can't get them out and that Mm -hmm. recirculation that you mentioned that can be known as um, auto intoxication so you're kind of like poisoning yourself i don't know that it sounds yeah like pretty Mm -hmm. extreme but it is the case these are toxins in the system Mm -hmm. your body's trying to get them out and if you're constipated if you've got an overgrowth of bacteria in the large intestine they're just going to go round and around and kind of make you feel absolutely terrible and affect every single cell of the body again so yeah and you know what it's funny because people i think a lot of people think it's some it should be so much more complex and it is like on a cellular basis it is much more complex but just describing it like that like something as simple as constipation Mm -hmm. and not absorbing the nutrients of and Mm -hmm. let's have a look at what and that's where i get uh, frustrated with um not frustrated but with conventional medicine that it's it makes it sound so much more complex whereas let's just have a look at yeah. putting those simple mm-hmm. th- simple things in to address to address that and get the the bowels moving and get the body absorbing nutrients and see where we go from there and i think that's what scares a lot of people off into even looking into it they're like no it can't be something that i'm dealing with like it's too complex i'm just, i've just got some constipation but then and, and i'm tired so they don't even bother looking into something because it's not explained simply and with a lot of things, yes, there's the more complex cases, but a lot of the time it's just the basics of healthy diet, avoiding inflammatory foods, um, managing stress, supporting immunity. They're the basics, but and commonly stress overlooked. Is a big one. Yeah, stress. Stress is a, a yeah. really big one. I would say that's one of, with leaky gut, there's so many triggers for leaky gut, yeah. as we know, um, and stress is one is a big one, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, yeah you can live and eat an organic diet you can live healthy but if you're if you're chronically stressed mm-hmm. then then your yeah. body isn't able to function mm-hmm. you're going to be spinning your wheels if not and yeah. do you think that celiac's becoming more prevalent or just more recognized um a bit of both i think definitely more prevalent so it all comes back to what gluten is and basically so gluten is a protein found in Um, grains such as wheat barley rye spelt and some oats it's kind of like Mm cross-contamination with oats um but the majority of gluten that people have a problem with is wheat Uh, those who aren't celiac that people have a problem with is wheat and that's because of how wheat has changed over the last even like 50 years so 50 years ago wheat wasn't what it is today it's been massively genetically modified to grow much quicker in order to basically promote bread production Mm -hmm. and so gluten is what makes bread rise and what holds bread together so in order to meet consumer demand we've genetically modified wheat to a protein that our body no longer recognizes and um this happens with in every single person not just people who are celiac or who have an intolerance but when we eat gluten um our body because our body doesn't know how to doesn't have the enzymes to digest that protein and what happens is it creates an inflammatory response by produce it getting the cells of the digestive system to produce something called zonulin and zonulin is what promotes that permeability so that leaky gut um, and in some people some healthy individuals their, their body might be good at restoring the health of the digestive tract so they might not necessarily have any symptoms or um, present any symptoms as such but that that damage is still still occurring um, and also it depends on like how often they eat it and, and what they eat obviously but um, in a lot of people, it presents with either even some sensitivity, some intolerance, or autoimmune disease, whether it's celiac disease or or any autoimmune condition. And that's why there's a big link with gluten and other autoimmune diseases rather than just celiac disease as yeah. well. With the leaky gut, so um, because gluten has been changed so much, I think that's why celiac, celiac disease is becoming more more um, diagnosed. And I do think we've got more research around it and better diagnostic techniques and we know what to look for so there's that side of things as well um but i don't think 50 years ago we would have had as many people with celiac disease no and probably back in the day people would would have had 
a loaf of bread once a week. It would have been fresh. It would have gone off in two days, whereas now it'll last on the shelf for like a week. It's got loads of preservatives and like 20 ingredients. It's not just flour, yeast, salt, and the common commonly used ingredients, what it should be made from. It's got all of these um, preservatives and colorings and sugar and vegetable oils for whatever reason. I don't even know why. Yeah. Which and, are triggers as well in themselves. Yeah. yeah. Like you've got an All inflammatory. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at what bread actually was back in the day, it was traditionally sourdough. Mm. Um, we had to ferment the bread. Yeah. And that fermentation process happens over however many hours. Like it's it's a long period, isn't it? So and that fermentation process actually um reduces the amount of gluten that's in the bread. So there was a I think there's a study done back in Italy a few years ago where they used a traditional um, wheat flour and the sourdough starter. And when they tested how much gluten was in, it was minuscule, very, very right. low from wheat Amazing. flour. I mean, it's still not safe for celiac. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would never recommend that. But, um, you know, I, for people who come to me with other digestive issues and um, I you know, I would recommend them to eat sourdough. So you said yeah. people who don't want to give up their bread. Mm-hmm. I was like, get get um, <laughs> long fermentation sourdough and see Absolutely. and see that because it's less processed and and it doesn't really have much gluten in there. Because if you think about what gluten is, it's it's something it's there to nourish the bread. It's not mm-hmm. there to to nourish us. Mm-hmm. So that there's a reason why back in the day we would ferment the bread. And yeah. I think we do have to go back to how we used to. Yeah, we've lost all of those traditional, mm. uh, all that traditional wisdom with other foods as well, like yeah. the, with fermented foods. I know it's come back in trend now, but that was lost for a, a number of years. And gluten actually translates to glue, doesn't it? I think it's yeah. in Latin, it means glue. So you can imagine it's sticking to the intestines. And with the sourdough, I recommend always buying organic because Mm -hmm. wheat is another even if it is you do ferment it and everything it's one of the highest spread crops and the pesticides alone could be what someone's reacting to um yeah we're having it like multiple times per day it's not just one sandwich every couple of days it's now in snack bars it's in pasta it's in your cereal it's in your bread having it so many times and any food that you have so so much it can become a problem so that may be a factor as well um, oh yeah absolutely it's yeah. at the end of the day gluten is a commodity now it's yeah. not just for bread anymore it's mm-hmm. it's it's in absolutely everything and um yeah because i think people who we, we don't need gluten to survive it's not it's mm-hmm. not a nutrient it, it's not a nutrient that we rely on like i said it's there to nourish the bread so if we remove gluten basically all we're doing really is removing processed food mm-hmm. that's the main thing yeah. if we think about wheat obviously you've got like rye and spelt which celiacs can't have but a lot of people can tolerate those much more because they are more of an ancient grain again quality matters the amount you have it matters um but yeah it, it, i wouldn't i wouldn't really think that gluten is necessary needed in the diet as such in mm-hmm. order to to be to be to healthy. survive and it always makes me laugh. Like I've had clients who I initially just ask them to go gluten-free just as a trial. And they're like, oh my God, I could never do that. I'll get deficient. And yet they've been on like crash diets and slim fast yeah. and slimming world. I'm like, you're not going to get deficient just by removing gluten. <laughs> it's not a it's health not, food. It's not a food group. No. It's not. It's not <laughs> yeah. I have, yeah, I have clients who um, the doctors say, oh, you're on a very limited diet. Yeah. <laughs> You've just removed processed mm-hmm. food. Mm-hmm. Basically just removed processed yeah. food. And fair enough, if you're swapping out gluten for gluten-free mm. products. Or yeah, processed talk about the problem with that. Yeah, so that that's more processed food. So free from products, um, as much as it's great that they're there and it's good that people like myself can get involved um, if we need to, they should still be there as like uh, now and then in the diet. Yeah. They shouldn't. We shouldn't rely on them as part Not of staple. Our, a staple yeah exactly because they're much more highly processed that if you look at a normal bread loaf and a gluten-free bread loaf the list is like two three four times as long Mm -hmm. there's just more stuff in there um so yeah there's much more sugar it's you it's probably not organic um based on corn which again is a highly spread crop and genetically modified and yeah just so much more sugar in there so i would i would always recommend against that whereas if you if you're having a, if you're swapping out gluten foods for naturally occurring um, gluten-free foods, so you know if we if we're looking at the food group, so we've got healthy sources of um, meat, fish, 
different proteins then you've got good quality sources of fats then you've got a diet focused on fruits vegetables leafy greens you've got some naturally gluten-free whole grains in there like quinoa brown rice um nuts seeds then you're not going to be losing out on any nutrients mm-hmm. and if anything you're gaining aren't you yeah. because you're swapping out um nutrient depleted foods for yeah. nutrient foods and yeah. if gluten's constantly wrecking your gut health then you're probably not getting an, enough nutrition anyway so removing yeah. that allow your gut to heal and you'll probably be more nutrient um high, have higher nutrients after removing gluten so yeah definitely important oh 100 percent. yeah <laughs> Well, so with celiac disease, yeah, you can never reintroduce gluten. Um, but with people and, and other autoimmune conditions, I would still mm. also be quite careful. But um, with like, I, I work with a lot of people who don't have um, celiac disease and have a lot of di- chronic digestive issues. And after a while, you know, you want to start reintroducing a little bit, maybe like, like I said, the sourdough or mm-hmm. some rye bread. I would never recommend reintroducing white bread, pasta, yeah crackers but and that's not just because of the gluten side of things that's because it's a processed Mm -hmm. food um and hopefully you would start to see that you can tolerate it a little bit more and it's about understanding how much you can have um and when to have it and seeing it as something you know if you're going out for breakfast and you want to have a nice piece of sourdough then that's fine but not having it as a staple in your diet um i think that's a big take-home point as well and for some people they can't reintroduce it Mm. it's something that they do have a problem with so so do you recommend everyone go gluten-free initially and then how would someone know when it's the right time to reintroduce and how would they know if they tolerate it or not um i would always recommend everyone to go gluten-free initially if um if i have if I have a reason for them to go gluten-free so obviously autoimmune disease celiac disease yes and most digestive digestive health issues and mm-hmm. um, I would try and remove it and it just it, it's that's t- a totally individual process so i have some clients who re- just reduce reducing processed food enough sometimes i don't even say the word remove gluten mm-hmm. i say remove processed food and it pretty much includes yeah all gluten um and by doing that over a few weeks and doing some gut restoring work with some good quality supplements if needed but mainly gut nourishing foods and doing that for a few weeks and having a few check-ins over a, um, a month or two and then um once i feel like their symptoms have reduced massively and that they're feeling much more energetic and their health is back on track and that they're telling me themselves that they feel like a different person Mm -hmm. that's when I would start to say okay let's have a look at introducing some long fermented sourdough bread for example um, and just have that once once a week and see see how you go Um, and it is more about I I don't want to give them a diet diary and tell them how to do it they need to figure figure out how to do it themselves otherwise it's never going to be a long-term thing mm-hmm. they're just going to go off and start eating it yeah. again as, as much as they can so so it's a per, it's a very personalized approach in that sense and yeah not everybody always needs to totally remove remove it it's just about how much we're eating of it and the, the sources and the quality mm-hmm. and are there any brands in the uk for the long long fermented sourdough breads because would you have someone just do like a tesco sourdough or just a conventional are there any good brands that you can recommend um, I always tell people to look for a local bakery mm. and if yeah. I so if I work with clients in York I know the local bakeries mm. around here I don't only because of my job I mean obviously I don't I don't use them um and then I'll I'll have a quick google search for clients who I'm working with who aren't local to York um and see if if any local bakeries around there I wouldn't recommend um like t- your standard supermarkets because it might say sourdough bread and it might have an element of sourdough mm-hmm but it isn't complete. It isn't yeah. a complete sourdough bread. It's still mass produced mm. to um, provide for, for the population, isn't it? So I don't know how they could promote, produce long fermented sourdough bread. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then we mentioned earlier about the gluten cross reactive foods, mm. dairy being one of them. Are there any others that maybe someone's just been diagnosed with celiac or really notices a strong reaction to gluten? Mm. They remove it. They feel a little bit better, but are there any other foods that they could maybe benefit from a temporary exclusion of yeah there's quite a lot actually that they say there's a cross reactivity and that's because of the protein molecules and how how they're put together basically um and also how the immune system responds so in autoimmune disease your immune system is a bit confused anyway and that's why it attacks tissue so it it can easily get confused for other things than gluten and um, dairy is one of them egg whites 
is another thing and then you've got your grain so a lot of people who are autoimmune do well on a low grain or grain free diet nuts and seeds um buckwheat buckwheat is one in particular and even gluten-free oats mm -hmm. so gluten-free oats is quite a big one that people have across reactivity to and yeah it might be beneficial for people to reduce them in the first instance to re to lower inflammation um it, it's quite difficult but i mean i've tried it i've tried to do like the autoimmune paleo diet and everything and i just if i'm honest i don't enjoy it and i mm. I don't it's to more it. stressful than it's, beneficial it's more <laughs> stressful and i think especially if someone's newly diagnosed and they're having to understand how to navigate the gluten-free world mm. um natural gluten-free world as well because it's it's easier to go to the free from products now and yeah. just buy those instead of what, what else you were buying so trying to optimize your health by going naturally gluten-free is going to be quite challenging mm -hmm. anyway um so unless unless they get a specific reaction to some foods i wouldn't necessarily remove it um but there are people out there who are very autoimmune sensitive and could do with reducing the those foods and doing like an autoimmune um protocol for a few months but i also think it's really important to um not not do it long term yeah. i think we need so you can remove those foods and feel better but we still need to work on restoring that gut health and bringing that immune system back into balance so that your body can start to tolerate foods more and your immune system can recognize these things as not foreign objects um and, it, and also it's quite hard to identify if you don't have a reaction what foods are cross-reactive for you yeah. because because a lot of the times where you don't have symptoms even though you have a reaction you don't have symptoms and that's actually a really important point to note for celiac disease i hear people say oh i'm not as sensitive as other people oh i have low-grade celiac and there's not really any such thing like if you have celiac disease you have celiac disease and fair enough you might be able you might have um some cross cross contamination so you might have some bread in the same toaster as a um, normal bread and for one person with celiac disease that does cause chronic symptoms for another person it doesn't but that in that autoimmune response is still happening inside the body regardless of of your symptoms so that's something important to to know i know people who drink whiskey for example because they can tolerate whiskey so your symptoms might be able to but internally the mm. damage is, is still occurring mm. and talk a bit more about testing so for you was it just a blood test um did you have an endoscopy so would you talk about the conventional testing methods how it's diagnosed whether blood tests may be normal but endoscopies can endoscopies sometimes be negative but it's actually a false negative mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first um, point of call is to go to the doctors and get a blood test. They'll test for antibodies. Um, if those antibodies are positive, so celiac antibodies, if they're positive, they will then refer you to get an endos endoscopy. And um, basically what happens is they take a biopsy of the villi and the small intestine and they look for the inflammation markers and they look at the health of the villi as well. So that's where that's where grading comes in i think as well so i think they have different grades for the the um, health of the villi and i think that can be translated sometimes to, to mm -hmm. patients and maybe that's where that confusion comes yeah. in about the level of celiac disease um so if you have if you have a damaged villi and you have the antibodies then that's pretty much a diagnosis of celiac disease when you go for the blood test at the gps my understanding is from patients from from clients sorry that um they only test one or two specific antibodies and they can come back with a false negative and that's because um the immune that can be due to a low Im immune response basically yeah uh, which can't is, mount a response yeah which is yeah. from but it's something that's genetic from birth and although that's not that common it's common in celiacs mm. So, um, is that the IgA antibody? The IgA, yeah. yeah so it's a, yeah. an IgA response, um, and they only look at this, those particular antibodies. So I think it's like tissue transglutaminase they look yeah. at, or yeah. um, transglutamine, yeah. um, or antiglidin as well. Antiglidin mm. they look at, and um, yeah, if the, if that comes back negative, even even doctors say, oh, it could be false negative, but there's nothing 
there's nothing they can do they can't then refer on they have mm. um, budgets as well on the nhs so it's difficult for them to to go any further with it um so there i've got a client now who had that and the doctor said that to her and i'm i'm pretty confident she probably does have mm. celiac um you know she's she ticks all the boxes um but what you can do is you can do private testing so um i think it's genova diagnostics i've never actually had to use it mm -hmm. but genova diagnostics do a test and they look at several different markers so they look at a full antibody count but they also look at the total iga so they look at how your body um responds to immunity and then they compare that basically against your antibody so it's much more comprehensive mm -hmm. it's not a diagnostic tool um but you can take that and go to the doctors and they'll be able to refer you for the endoscope because you do need that for the for the diagnosis and then once you're diagnosed um you're referred to a dietitian. I don't think I got referred to a dietitian. I don't think that was around when I was younger. I, I don't think so anyway. I don't remember that. Um, but now you go to a dietitian and basically they help you figure out how to go gluten free, um, which is, it's good to have that support, but um, dietitians and nutritional therapists work differently because they're, they're trained from a different perspective. Dietitians are still very NHS focused. They have to work with protocols and work for specific diseases. And um, so for example, when I said about the dairy and the lactose, I think they'd be more inclined to keep dairy mm -hmm. in the diet because of the risk of osteoporosis because your body's not absorbing the minerals. Um, I don't think they would necessarily consider the fact that your body probably won't be able to produce enzymes to digest dairy. Mm -hmm. They don't see it as a bigger picture. And that's just because of, of their training and, and the job that they have to do at the end of the day. Um, so there's a lot of, advi lot of advice that we would give as nutritional therapists, but um, that's that people aren't given um, through dietitians or through the, the, um, the NHS, basically. Yeah, and I've been to one of those gluten and free from shows. I went, I was working for CNM, at one of the stalls last year i think it was or the year before oh. and i just what, had a look around and they were just giving it like gluten-free crumpets and tea mm -hmm. cakes and bread and everyone was like so happy and just eating all of this stuff there was not one healthy product sampled in the whole arena um, and then i went to watch some of the talks by dietitians and you're right it was i was just like biting my tongue all the way through like uh, no yeah. please please don't say that but and they're coming from a good place, and you're right. They're just not. They're not aware of the um, other things like the the microvilli and the microbiome and detoxification. Um, and there is a place for the dietitians in some some cases, but people often confuse nutritional therapists and dietitians. So I'm happy that you made that that difference as well. Um, yeah. and it's not about being right or wrong in any no. sense. It's just a totally different perspective yeah. in the way that that your approach the approach really is yeah. yeah and for someone who still feels sick and ill after removing gluten mm -hmm. apart from the potential cross-contamination the gluten cross-reactive foods what other reasons could that be and what could they do to support themselves and figure out what else is going on yeah so this is this is the main important mm -hmm. point really here is because by, just by removing gluten, absolutely people start to get better. Um, I think I started to improve within within a year. Um, some people can take like six weeks, mm. sometimes three months. Um, and you do start to get better because you're not having that autoimmune response anymore and the antibodies go down and the villi start to grow back. So basically your body's not necessarily in that autoimmune response. However, if you think about the damage to the digestive system we mentioned, there's that just by removing gluten you aren't repairing that damage so you might be taking kind of like the trigger away mm -hmm. let's say but you're not actually doing the rest restorative work and then it's not just the health of the digestive system uh, the the leaky gut it's the whole digestive system so how well is your stomach acid functioning what is the health of your microbiome are your bowels working effectively is your liver detoxifying so you've got that whole picture so we need to put the steps in place to restore that and that is why a lot of the time people with celiac disease and again other autoimmune conditions just continue down this health like ill health spiral and mm. um, they get diagnosed with ibs because their digestive system is still damaged basically yeah. um other like autoimmune diseases tend to come in clusters mm. and that is because the damage is still there 
you've still got that internal environment for an autoimmune disease to present itself. And then you've got a multitude of environmental triggers, stress, medications, loads of different things. And just because, so just because you have um, celiac disease doesn't mean to say you can't get another autoimmune condition. Yeah. The genetics for autoimmune, I mean, I don't know much about genetics, don't get me wrong, but there's, um, a, it's, it's very complex. There's loads of different genes that contribute to autoimmunity. For example, none of my family have celiac disease, but there's a massive autoimmune gene in my family mm. because my grandma has autoimmunity. My mum has a few autoimmune diseases. My uncle does, my sister does. So, right. but none of them are celiac. So yeah. you've got that risk factor there. And basically what happens is when you have the, when the digestive system is still damaged and you have those antibodies circulating, they enter the blood and they can attack other tissues in the body. So there's a high prevalence with uh, celiac disease and um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And I think it's, more, it's, I think it's about the fact that um, the thyroid gland and the thyroid hormones are quite sensitive to the antibodies and celiac disease. And there is actually communication between the immune systems. Um, so they still don't really know much about that. They're still looking into it, but basically there's some communication there and there's a prevalence. And then type 1 diabetes is another one to consider as well. Mm. Type 1 diabetes usually comes first. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I talk to get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and then they, um, they get diagnosed with celiac. And I think it's 10% of people with type 1 diabetes have celiac disease. Um, and it's actually shown that people with type 1 diabetes removing gluten from their diet has um, really, really positive yeah. impacts. That, that's, that's, a, that's, quite, that's a big fact. So... So yeah, it's it's about restoring the overall digestive health, and that's not something that's really recommended uh, or advised. And of course, people are going to their their doctors, to the dietitians, to everybody, and and they're trusting in these people, which is right. Like obviously, we need to trust in them, but we also need to educate ourselves and and start asking questions. Well, why aren't I getting better? You know, why why do if I'm if I've removed gluten from my diet, surely I should be back mm -hmm. to normal and thriving. Um, so we need to, yeah, we need to start asking more questions and, and doing research really. Yeah. It's not just, it. it's not just bad luck. It's not just genetics. It doesn't have to be that way forever. Your body's telling you, it's giving you messages that something's wrong and you just need to put the puzzle pieces together. Um, mm -hmm. ideally work with someone cause it is complex and all of this gut healing, it's hard to do on your own, especially if you've got like brain fog or something, you probably got no idea where, where to start. So I think and having someone so guide you. Yeah, yeah, I know. There's so much information out there. And it is, it's 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 just being able to put that responsibility on someone else to help mm. you basically. Yeah. It just takes that stress off off mm -hmm. people. And um yeah, it can take it can take a little while, it can be a long process, or it can be a, a more positive a, a quicker process. It just it just depends on the individual and how well they um kind of stick to the the interventions that are put mm. in place really. Um, but there's, I tend to stay away from doing anything really, really drastic with clients. Mm -hmm. Like I said, like the autoimmune protocols and stuff. I just, I want it to be long term, and I want people to, I want to teach people, and I want people to learn and understand what celiac disease is, what autoimmune disease is, what their risk, future risk factors are, and how they have control in preventing that and and living an optimal, healthy life. Um, there's there's so many there's so many worse things out there as well than mm -hmm. than celiac disease and and we can live an optimal healthy life with it we just need to know how to and we do need to put the hard work in um but i i actually see see my celiac disease now as a, a blessing mm -hmm. and it's introduced me to my health and made me who i am and i probably wouldn't enjoy food as much if i wasn't celiac because i'd probably be eating rubbish, <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. It wouldn't, yeah. have, it wouldn't have made me aware of what being healthy is um yeah and I, i'm thankful that i don't have the option to eat, mm. eat the food, to be honest yeah. yeah and i've said that for myself with all of the health issues i went through and like when clients are struggling with maybe a new diagnosis i just explain the majority of the time they're not life-threatening there's something that's reversible so yes you may have to put a bit of effort in um not eat out all of the time for a short period of um, their life and really cook from scratch as much as possible, make these decisions in the short term, but long term you're actually reducing your risk of future 
conditions as well and a lot of young people as well they're like oh why do I have to be so strict when all my friends like going out eating McDonald's and drinking every weekend (laughs) and they have to like cook the chicken and all of these vegetables all the time but I explained that maybe those people look healthy but sometimes the having diarrhea every day or the crippled with anxiety or painful periods um now they're just not saying anything or even if they're the picture of health and they have no issues at all long term mm-hmm. sadly they can be the people who get given an a life threatening diagnosis or have a condition developed that is incurable and it's maybe too late to actually intervene so it is mm-hmm. a bit of a, a blessing in disguise having oh, a health yeah. issue especially when you're young as well and then learning how to take care of your body for the rest of your life so I love that silver lining and yeah it's put you on your path um, Mm -hmm. to study and now help other people in the same situation yeah just build a career and a lifestyle yeah Yeah. 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 perfect and what about foods to increase so I Mm. like that you're also not very strict and restrictive and taking food groups away are there any specific foods to add in that could help Mm restore nutrient levels restore the gut microbiome and lining yeah so i always just uh, focus on getting a a good healthy plate in first um so i look at um healthy sources of protein healthy sources of fats i want those in each meal um then really nutrient dense so things like eggs have loads of nutrients and even though they might be a cross reaction reactive protein i'd prefer to get them in and and get the benefits of the the nutrients while working on the the gut health and the digestive health um and then i like to look at vegetables firstly and it depends on um how much fruit and veg people are eating how many plants people are eating before they come to see me so I always ask for a food diary so I can get an idea but it's just slowly increasing them you don't want to increase them all at once because they are really high in fiber and fiber is what helps to feed our microbiome so um, if we have quite an unhealthy microbiome and unhealthy digestive system adding all that fiber at once can cause um nasty symptoms mm-hmm. basically even even a little bit of fiber can as well and yeah. um, it's not always a, it's not always a bad thing it's just you know if it's happening if it's constantly happening and you're getting a lot of um, really foul gas and you, mm. you want to be running that back a bit so uh, yeah i slowly introduce it i try and get people to aim for having five portions of vegetables a day over over a period of time depending on how many they were having before and then just start to increase it more and get some um, healthy fruits in the health or the healthy fruits in there like um, berries um, apples are really good you know just just a big range of plant foods mm-hmm. really um, nuts seeds so just focusing on the natural gluten-free foods that's the first thing and then further down the line once once they're used to working with me I start to go in with things like the bone broth yes. <laughs> and the st- <laughs> food apple. You, you ease them in and then you <laughs> throw all of these <laughs> yeah I never mentioned bone broth in the first consultation <laughs> and I want them to come I do um, <laughs> I'm like you're having livers every week like <laughs> deal yeah, with it <laughs> I, do. I do try and mention that actually like yeah and also it's um you can buy you can buy good quality organ meat so much cheaper so oh. that's something I I've like changed in my diet a lot it's obviously mm. the organ I can't afford to get organic all the time mm. but I I make sure I invest weekly in organic yeah. in an organic fruit and veg box and my organic meat and it's just meant that I've had to reduce the amount of meat I eat I don't eat a whole lot I have some every I have it every day but I just don't eat massive portions of it Mm -hmm. Um, and I've included a lot more organ meat in my diet and yeah it's it's really cost effective Mm -hmm. and getting quality nutrient dense food so yeah organ meat is really important actually um so yeah just building a good plate there and then yeah I'd go in with something like bone broth um it does freak people out a little bit but I think it's becoming more more common i think a lot yeah, of people definitely. find have bone broth now and the reason i like bone broth is because it's it's just so nutrient dense we've been we've been drinking it for centuries mm-hmm. and basically what you do is you get some really good quality um bones it can be beef bones chicken bones i use a slow cooker um fill it up with water vegetable scrapings like onion peel carrot tops um get some turmeric black pepper in there and then a good splash of apple cider vinegar and then i cook that for at least 24 hours and what happens is um over that period of time the um, nutrients leach from the bones into the water and that's where the apple cider vinegar comes in Mm -hmm. that helps to remove to remove the the nutrients and i think they say around about 24 hours is the the perfect time to get the majority of the nutrients out 
And basically the nutrients you're looking at is collagen, amino acids and minerals. So if you think for celiac disease, um, collagen is really important to restore the digestive tract. So just how it likes to plump out wrinkles in the skin, it kind of does the same to the digestive system. It, um, you know, um, rebuilds the, the holes from the, from the permeability. And then you've got things like amino acids, the proteins which are building blocks for every cell in the body. But in particular, um, L-glutamine. So that's really, uh, bone broth is really rich in L-glutamine and that promotes the mucous membrane, um, which is a protective layer of the digestive system. And the mucous membrane kind of acts a little bit like the glue as well to the, the digestive lining. And it's what helps um, promote the immune system and um, the healthy microbiome as well. And then looking at minerals, obviously with celiac disease, we are malnourished a lot of the time if our villi are still damaged. So getting a really good source of minerals in there is really important for um, all bodily functions, especially like bone development. And I mean, I have a recipe and a, a list of all the benefits on, on my website, but um, the, the way I like to do it is I like to drink it. So I like to add turmeric to it and um, some black pepper and just drink it as a, a drink on an evening. On an evening, it's meant to be, chicken broth's meant to be really good because it's meant to help promote sleep. Mm. So that's quite a good time to have it as well. Um, it's also a good source of protein at breakfast mm -hmm. if, you, yeah. if, you, if you struggle to do that. And then I like to freeze it in ice cube trays and I can add it to smoothies, soups, use it as a stock. And I also keep, because when you let it cool, you have to... Um, take the layer of the oh, layer yeah. of fat off and I like to roast my vegetables mm -hmm. in that as well yeah yeah so you get a lot out of the a chicken so if you buy a nice organic chicken have the meat over a couple of days use the bones then use that in soups you can mm -hmm. use it to um cook rice and quinoa and all of these things in as well yeah. for a bit more flavor yeah, sauces. yeah. So absolutely. Many things you can do with it yeah absolutely um another thing I like to use is um stewed apples with the skin mm, on yeah um, I love to have a batch of those in my in my fridge. Um, yeah, I've got a recipe for that as well on my website. And the reason I like to keep the skin on is because of the pectin fibers. And that is what the fiber that really helps feed the microbiome mm -hmm. and promote a strong, healthy immune system. Because um, I don't know if I've mentioned this actually, but up to, well, depending on what you read, 70 to 80% of the immune system lives in the digestive tract. So if you think of celiac disease as an immune condition, obviously gut health and the microbiome is crucial, a crucial mm -hmm. point there as well. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people can get sick very frequently and have the cold sores and hay fever and allergies to other foods because their immune system's just wrecked. And yeah. the bone broth, I don't personally tolerate it well, but mm. a lot of people do. And I have an instant pot because I did go through a period of time trying to use it, which I tolerate a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. because of the histamine content, it just starts to liberate after a few hours. So in the instant pot, you can do... 24 hour bone broth in like two hours so it's oh wow, really? yeah yeah mm. it's really you get the exact same and you don't stink your whole house out <laughs> oh, <I might laughs> with the... do that. My, my boyfriend really hurts oh, bone yeah. Again, it really hurts. yeah it conceals all of the smell perfect and it's oh, good for right. yeah good for making you do loads of other things in it though don't yeah you? yeah well. you can make soups better. and stews yeah. and really easy to digest foods because i think that's another important mm. point you don't want to be eating lots of um, cold foods and raw salads and icy cold drinks when you have a gut issue whether it's celiac or not you need to make sure things are pureed and mashed at least initially mm -hmm. have like some shredded meat in a soup or a stew rather than having like a big hunk of steak and a big huge salad and lots of raw nuts and seeds that's really just for general health anyway most people don't tolerate that well no i'm a big fan of warm yeah. foods i've mm -hmm. noticed a big difference in my own health um, and I actually, because I love, I love smoothies um, and I actually went off smoothies for a little while just to, just to see. And yeah, I did. I noticed mm. a massive improvement and now it's just finding that balance as well. Sometimes I'll have a salad, but I just make sure I have loads of olive oil yeah. in it. And I tend to have, if I'm having salad, I have it at home so I can roast vegetables mm. and have like warm mm -hmm. roasted vegetables yeah. in it. And I just have smoothies every every now and then I'm not mm -hmm. having them every single day and but yeah warming food is so important because our body can only digest warm foods so if mm -hmm. you're putting cold foods in you have to spend more digestive energy, energy to make it warm yeah basically so yeah, yeah. It needs to puts an extra effort in there and if your gut's already compromised you're just not helping you're not supporting your body in that way 
and exactly. yeah same with smoothies if i'm having a smoothie i'll not use a lot of frozen mm. vegetables or fruit i'll let them come up to room temperature i'll add warming herbs and spices like ginger roots and cinnamon mm-hmm. to that and drink it slowly so it's not like a huge icy cold fruit smoothie on an empty stomach because that really puts out the digestive fire and that's more like ayurvedic and traditional medicine chinese medicine they're all really into that so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, so i love that point as well Mm -hmm. and what about tips for navigating eating out because that must be very stressful it's getting better these days because things are labeled for allergies and they're very conscious because they don't obviously want to get in trouble with anyone but how do you navigate eating out at restaurants would you recommend calling them out in advance or just speaking with the chef when you get there or are they pretty good so i'm not sure um yeah so you've got celiac uk certified restaurants um which should be pretty safe um but they tend to be the kinds of foods i wouldn't really want to mm. eat um like chain restaurants yeah um which are good for if you're out and about and you, you do need something so that yeah you've got those that you can go to if you're going just out for a meal to a, a regular restaurant then yeah I would recommend ringing ahead I mean I, I eat out often it's quite a, a big part of my social life um so I I, I ring ahead sometimes or I kind of get to know the restaurants I go to so I always talk to a wait a waiting staff and explain that I'm celiac I don't just say mm. or gluten free yeah. I always explain that I'm celiac um and I always choose a dish that I think is least likely to be mm contaminated i think that's important as well and um, so i tend to just go for like some some fish some some meat and some vegetables mm-hmm. um because I, I i do think it's a level of my responsibility eating yeah, out some that doesn't cater for they can tell me what's mm. gluten free but there's always like a, ris- a risk of cross-contamination and that's another reason why i just keep on top of my health so much because if that I am at risk of cross contamination, and although that autoimmune response may still be happening, at least my if I've got optimal immune health and optimal digestive health, my body just has much more of an uh, opportunity to manage it um, and not have the detrimental effects. So, so I would say keeping health, like you know, maintaining mm-hmm. your health the majority of the time is is a first is a good point as well. Yeah, don't go eating out when you're stressed and you've maybe had a yeah. stomach infection the day before because you're going to be very likely to the tiniest amount of gluten is going to really hit you hard yeah you're going to be really vulnerable yeah, to it yeah. so yeah just keep, keep on top of your health um well and then eat out just you know now and mm-hmm. then when it's uh, there's a lot of people who don't eat out who are celiac mm-hmm. and i get that that they're really worried about it and um, but i think for me personally like that it's a big part of my social life mm-hmm. and I, I want to live an, a normal optimal life so yeah. so i i it's kind of like a compromise I take and um, I also take um toasty bags out with me so a lot of places you go for bre- <laughs> like you know the bags you put to you mm-hmm. my bags that you put oh, bread right, in. yeah um and so if I go out for breakfast a lot of places mm. will have gluten-free bread but they use a, yeah, yeah. just a normal toaster so oh, I always get a, a little um <laughs> my use in. this please <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> again I have to trust that they do use yeah. it um i don't see why they wouldn't so that's a good tip i always have a toasty bag mm. with you um where do they sell and, those i've not seen those in years i just i mean i just got them on amazon yeah i just got them on amazon i think like lakeland or right or i don't know so yeah. them, but amazon's always a good shout mm-hmm. they do different sizes um so yeah i would i would highly recommend taking one of those out about with you never heard that uh, tip that's a good one yeah yeah I, I was really happy that i came up with that it was only a few years a few years ago i was like how have i never done this <laughs> um you should patent I, it I don't, I should, I should. put your name on that you you created this i should design some uh some toasted AF bags logo on it <laughs> yeah well you heard it yeah, yeah you exactly it um what else would i would i say and yeah just I, I suppose it's just raising awareness to the people that are taking your order hmm. um i also like to have digestive enzymes it's not necessarily Mm. going to help with the gluten side of things but um just sometimes if i'm out i will have dairy which i don't usually have a lot of but sometimes i'll have uh, butter and things Mm or cheese or whatever and yeah i just like to take a digestive enzyme with me um just to help help my body digest and to be fair i tend to take them them with most meals yeah um, but especially especially if I'm eating out because they tend to they do, they do tend to be heavier mm. don't they in, in oils and different things so 
And what so, yeah, about them um, specific gluten? Have you seen the specific gluten yeah. breakdown enzymes? Have you used them? Yeah. Have you looked into them? You know, I've never, fan. I've never used them. I think for celiac disease, it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. Not well, I was going to say not for you, yeah. but yeah. Um, people with with uh, gluten issues, I suppose it could help. But I mean, it's still going to cause gluten still in the mm. diet, isn't it? It's still going mm-hmm. to cause a, uh, an inflammatory response to some to some degree. It just might not be as bad. It can reduce the symptoms. So I suppose it's good for people to have on hand if they can't control again if they're in a situation of cross-contamination and they're super sensitive because there's a lot of um i would say a lot of people out there who are intolerant to gluten could potentially have more of a symptom onset than a lot of celiacs like i i don't really get symptoms of, of celiac disease if i if i eat out and i've been gluten i tend to i tend to know about it but i don't get them often so mm. i and I eat out a bit, so I would say that I don't have the typical digestive responses as people who are intolerant yeah. to yeah. gluten. So, so yeah, mm-hmm. maybe the, the enzymes would be. Would be okay. Beneficial. And let's just touch on the difference between celiac, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or just a gluten intolerance, and wheat allergy. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... So yeah, a lot of people get confused with mm. gluten intolerance and celiac disease. So yeah. celiac disease is the autoimmune yeah. response and you can't tolerate gluten in the diet even if you don't get the symptom onset. Like we discussed, that autoimmunity will still be there. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a new term um, that, uh, yeah, it's still quite new. I, I think they're just trying to figure out how the immune system is involved with it. Mm. Um, I kind of see it as gluten intolerance and the fact, like we, dis- like we said before, gluten is now in so many foods and so many people have an issue with it. And because more people are going to them with gluten problems, they've created a disease and now they're uh, to diagnose and now they're yeah. looking at research into it. But it just all comes back to an, an unhealthy digestive mm-hmm. system and the immune system creating like an Ig response. So by addressing the gut health, and repairing any damage to the digestive system, getting a strong, healthy microbiome, you would hope that the um, glu- the intolerance to gluten would would reduce, um, and you would hopefully be able to reintroduce some of it. But some people do generally just have mm-hmm. an intolerance, and they can't have it. Um, yeah, I, I I don't really I don't really think non celiac gluten sensitivity is any different mm-hmm. to, to a gluten intolerance right now. And what about wheat allergy? Yeah. So wheat allergy tends to be much more, you don't necessarily have to eat it. That's my understanding of it. You don't necessarily have to eat it. So you could just be like walking through wheat fields mm. and you can get an allergic response on the skin. Um, and it's just a different immune response in internally. Yeah. Um, and it tends to be much more of an immediate response mm-hmm. as well. Um, and it can come out as things like sneezing, skin rashes, rather than necessarily digestive mm-hmm. digestive issues. Yeah. So just like any other food, you can just be allergic to any food really, can't you? So... I think that's mm. the, the differentiation. It's not going to destroy your intestines, mm. but you probably not feel good when you're eating yeah, exactly. or around it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, just some more recommendations on the co the comorbidities comorbid- that can often go alongside celiac. So the skin condition that you mentioned. Do you have any tips for improving that? If someone had the the dermatitis, any topical or anything else they could do or is it really just improving gut health it's imp- it is improving yeah. gut health i mean yeah there will be things you could put on topically things like turmeric mm-hmm. and manuka honey to take down yeah. that inflammation that itchiness but the root cause is the digestive mm-hmm. health and mm-hmm. um, so that's i think that's the main thing with everything so um even the risk factors of other autoimmune conditions and the long-term risk factors of osteoporosis and even things as serious as bowel cancer the focus right now is getting your gut health in optimal function and balancing your immune system that's it's really important to stay focused on the immune system as well so um vitamin this is where vitamin d comes in and that that plays a really important role so i test all of my clients for vitamin d um, I think I just use Better You online mm-hmm. and it's like yep. 32 pound finger prick test. So I would always recommend to get your vitamin D levels checked and you want to be looking at it to be above 100 at least. You want it to up towards like 130, especially in autoimmune conditions. The NHS guidelines are for above 50 and that's because 50 is disease 
test it. So they're mm -hmm. looking at disease levels rather than optimal health. So just some places aware. are like 30. Like are some of my clients, yeah, yeah, like still like 30 to 200. I'm like, oh my God, you could be 31. They're like, yeah, you're yeah. fine. It's like that with iron. I yeah. think I, my iron came back at like, I can't remember, like 51 or something. And it was mm -hmm. like, the disease state was like 49. But yeah. I was fine. I was yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you have to really. Yeah, yeah, have to be aware of the the optimal levels rather than the the, the disease state, um, and basically what vitamin D does is it helps to balance the immune system. So if you think as if you think of our autoimmune um, system as a seesaw, and in a, a healthy a healthy individual with a healthy balanced immune system, that seesaw is just at level, so it's just balancing along. In autoimmune disease, that seesaw tips. So one side of it is really high. What vitamin D does is it helps to bring that back into balance so it prevents that autoimmune um, presentation. So in a lot of, in actually in, most, in pretty much every case of vitamin D is, is low. It's taken me about two years to get my Ooh. vitamin D above 100 oh because um, see that disease as well, you quite often have um, a mutation on the, Mm. on the BDR, BDR receptor so the gene for the vitamin D gene um and I know I, I have that mutation because I've tested yeah. my genetics so it's taken me a lot a few years of like safe sun exposure and sensible um supplementation with quality supplements to get my vitamin D levels high um so that's that's something that's really important and I recommend testing at least twice a year so mm -hmm. beginning of like springtime when you're coming out of winter beginning of summer and then like autumn time so just so you know what levels yeah. to to supplement with yeah, so now is like a key time. If you haven't tested all year, so you're not going into winter, completely rock bottom, it's just going to get worse. And in mm. the UK, it's harder for us anyway to get enough vitamin mm. D because we get some like 10 days of the year, <laughs> the majority of the and time. And we're in the so, office, we're in an yeah, office. I know, exactly. The and then when we're told to cover up as well, like mm. midday, which is when we need yeah. to expose our skin, um, arms, legs, face, we need mm -hmm. to expose to the midday sun in order to um, synthesize vitamin d and it's quite incredible it's something i'm quite passionate about actually it's quite incredible how mother nature has given us the sun and it's kind of given us an indication as to when we've been in it too long when we've yeah. got the most out of it so we can we need to use the sun for vitamin d synthesis and, and other functions as well like it's been shown to reduce cardiovascular disease um, and then if we're obviously in it for too long, that's just our skin, our skin burning is telling us to, you know, you've got mm -hmm. all the vitamin D, you've got all the benefits out of it, you, you know, get out of the sun. So I think I, it's, it takes um, half the time, in an auto distance as um, efficient vitamin D, it takes half the amount of time that your skin would burn, if you get me. So say if you could be in the sun for 20 mm -hmm. minutes, until your skin burns in, it would only necessarily it would only take you ten minutes okay. to synthesize enough vitamin D. That that's mm. what that's what the research suggests anyway. Interesting. Um, again, genetics come into that. So with my yeah. feed, it's probably I I find it much more difficult. Mm -hmm. so, I'm so, the yeah. same here. And um, what about someone who's in the fifties or sixties and only has recently been diagnosed with celiac, which is crazy, it, but it does happen, yeah. and they're really concerned about bone health. Mm -hmm. is there anything else that they could be doing to support bone health obviously optimizing vitamin d levels healing the gut anything mm -hmm. else that they could think of to just support their cells during that time yeah i mean obviously our bones are um kind of made and set the structure by the late 20s so yeah. optimal time is is like teenage years um but yeah there are there are things that you can still do so exercising is is one of them to rege to help um regenerate bone strength testing the vitamin d levels is really important um and restoring gut health like you said mm -hmm. um and the, you know you can you can take supplements if you want to but that would be really personalized mm -hmm. um so i mean to be fair i always put a really good quality multivitamin in mm -hmm. with uh, with celiac disease because i'd like to, i'd like to go very broad rather than focus on specific nutrients. I think if you see that disease, we need, yeah. we need that very broadly. And I'm, I'm always on some sort of multivitamin, um, even though my, I feel like my gut health is mm -hmm. functioning optimally and I'm absorbing, just because we are always vulnerable. We are always vulnerable to, to the villi being damaged. So um, I would probably recommend a really good quality uh, multivitamin. But work it, I think working with a practitioner to get that personalised advice is really important. Mm -hmm. 
I there might be so many other things going on are they yeah. female are they male mm-hmm. like what, what 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 else is going yeah, on absolutely yeah. and final few questions mm-hmm. um because i know that we've covered a lot of different things that could, we could probably continue chatting for another hour i'm sure but i'm <laughs> so- mindful of the time so the last few questions are more um on the first one being an ideal breakfast for someone with celiac disease so they can't have the some of the cereals they can't have the toast and jam well they could they could have the gluten-free but we're saying that it's not that optimal so what options would you suggest so i like to introduce a gut loving smoothie a couple of times a week um again i don't get them to have it all the time because of the the Mm -hmm. cold food element but it's basically a good handful of blueberries um some biomel yogurt so have you heard of the yeah. biomel? it's basically um a coconut a mm-hmm. coconut drink with uh, loads of good healthy bacteria mm-hmm. it's really delicious so um with some of that um a good tablespoon of whole flax seeds for the fiber and the flax seeds are really good for restoring the mucilage and the, and the mm-hmm. digestive system and then a nutritionist approved protein powder mm-hmm and topped up with some some good like some filtered water or some good quality um nut milk or something and blended together sometimes i like to add an avocado or something in there as well to to get the fats up um and maybe having that alongside a couple of boiled eggs um just again to be eating food because Mm. um by having that's another thing to point out by having um smoothies and liquid food it kind of tricks our digestive system to to not recognize food come in so then our enzymes aren't prepared mm-hmm. um so when i do have a smoothie i tend to like not chew snack it on something. Can, but i just yeah, I yeah just, keep I it in your mouth something, but i keep it in my mouth to yeah. get the saliva mm-hmm. to produce the enzymes and yeah i like to have it alongside like some eggs or something just so my my uh, digestive system's functioning there so that's more of a quick breakfast um for people who are on the go and then a really favorite of mine is something like shakshuka mm. something that's really warming and um got plenty of vegetables in there so you can put anything you want in there really sometimes i have it with chickpeas so i don't have the eggs because i i i'm a bit funny with egg whites like i can't have too many um it, you know it, it causes me to get, um, have a lot of mucus i think mm. it breaks me out in spots mm-hmm. sometimes so I'm, I'm very i'm very aware of that uh, i love eggs so i still have them in my diet i just don't have them as often um chickpeas with with the shakshuka is a good a good shout and you can make that sauce in advance and, and yeah. keep it in the fridge and then just heat it up and add your eggs or whatever you want to it yeah um it's just making sure you're getting a good good source of fat protein and then i, I, I like to get the vegetables in there mm-hmm. as well um but some i'm sure you have some recipes on your website of those I am do. i right yeah? yeah perfect we'll link to those, those website, yeah and I've seen you post the pictures of your breakfast and things like, oh my God, I wish I could be bothered <laughs> making something like that. I'm just That's not, it. I'm just not a cook at all. I just, yeah. I, I only have... post one. I only yeah. post one. <laughs> I'm not, I don't do that every single day. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's unrealistic. <laughs> mm, true. And with um, the eggs as well, duck, have you ever tried duck eggs? They might be a good thing to try I, I don't i don't have them often i have had them like when i'm out yeah. and about yeah yeah, yeah but, that um, could be some people who are sensitive to chicken eggs so anyone who's listening who has celiac and notices eggs are a problem sometimes uh, duck eggs could be pretty well tolerated they're is that a different maker yeah they're like quite the different, different mm. proteins or structure mm. or whatever so that could be worth trying yeah and are there any useful supplements that you recommend you've said a good qual- quality multivitamin um, mm. checking vitamin d to mm-hmm. test and not guess and just go like yeah. megadose when you don't know what you're doing anything else or any like the protein powder then any, any brands that you recommend for that yeah so i would recommend well just because i use them um form form mm-hmm. do a good protein powder and then revolution foods i quite like yep. um there are other ones out there i've not i've not personally personally use them i think pulsing do like pea protein mm. powders you do have to i like the them. new zest one that's pretty oh, available that's yeah that's really nice just a pea protein that's available in like even internationally as well so oh. i'll link to all of these brands in the the show notes as well yeah perfect yeah. i'll have to try that one i'm always i'm always out looking for a new yeah it's really good that. Um, and then i like to put a digestive enzyme in usually yeah. as well mm. and i do tend to put some sort of um gut health focus mm. supplement but it, that just depends on mm. each each individual yeah. perfect and are there any recommended resources on 
gluten avoidance, um, celiac, any books or we websites? You mentioned the Celiac UK for restaurants, any charities mm. and websites that you've found to be helpful? So I really, I do use Celiac UK. Um, again, their advice is still quite generalised as in um, it's still kind of like public health based yeah. I suppose, rather than, than individualised based but they've got a lot of information on there um, about like risk factors just to educate yourself around celiac disease and um, you can sign up to their directory they send you like a book I've not, I've not done that for years but it, mm. it basically tells you what what foods in every supermarket are gluten free okay. um, which is quite handy for people learning to navigate mm. um, but my advice for that would be just shop naturally gluten free mm. The parameters um, of the store. Are yeah, the parameters of the store yeah. of the inside. Yeah. yeah. Although gluten free aisles tend to be on the parameters. Oh, <laughs> really? Oh. <laughs> sometimes they Ignore do. Ignore that then. <laughs> no, no, no. Only in some <laughs> supermarkets. Yeah. Um, but a really good book that I like and I recommend it to a lot of my clients is Gut by Julia oh, yeah. Enders. Have you yeah. ever read it? Love that one. I, yeah, mm. I really like it. And it's, it's not, uh, even though it is very research and evidence based, mm -hmm. it's the way she writes it. Yeah. It's, um, e got and some it's nice really, diagrams in there. And it's, yeah, it really makes yeah. sense and it's, it's a really easy read. And I think it's the perfect um, education tool yeah. for people to really get to understand their digestive health and their immune system and how they work together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I've read that one um, mm -hmm. lots of times and it's a good tool to have on hand and it's a good introduction to the subject, like you said. Mm. Um, one piece of advice that you give to someone who's newly diagnosed oh um stay away from processed gluten-free products yeah. eat a natural mm -hmm. gluten-free diet and potentially work with mm -hmm. someone in order to yeah. to address the inflammation and stuff yeah just to get give you a kickstart into the recovery yeah absolutely yeah. and mm -hmm. final question abby is where can people find more about you online yes of course so i love being on instagram I'm, you can find me at AF underscore nutrition, where I share all of my nutrition insights and celiac friendly recipes and just my general day to day life as a celiac. Um, and then I have a website, afnutrition.co.uk, where you can find out more about me. You can um, download some freebies I've got on there and you can find out more about my, like how I work with people and how to contact me amazing and i'm glad that we scheduled 90 minutes because we've <laughs> we've covered it all actually yeah is that how we've, long? yeah back on 90 minutes i feel like there's so much out i know and yeah. About, but yeah and yeah. you'll have to come on again in the future i'm sure that people will have lots of questions so i'll make sure to save them and then you can come back on, on the podcast and we can chat some more so yeah oh, thank okay. you for joining us today um, and sharing your insights on celiac and gluten oh thank you for having me i've really enjoyed it <laughs>